the relationship that I had with the brewery when I was growing up was was very much like a family member. It's hard to think of the brewery as just a, a box with some kettles. You know, it's definitely a living, breathing entity. And you knew you never really could just turn your back on it because it's alive. Welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a new podcast from Consensus Digital Media. I'm Connor Gaughan, publisher at Consensus and host of the pod, where we talk to innovators and entrepreneurs who have built businesses and careers that do well while doing good for the world. Today, I'm joined by special guest host, Kate Tucker. Hello, everyone. Kate's the creative director at Consensus and host of the Hope Is My Middle Name podcast. She's also the host of our YouTube series, Glass Half Full, which covers sustainable breweries across America. That's where we first met today's guests. And I couldn't be more thrilled to talk with them because they're pretty much the holy grail of craft brewing. Every beer drinker has their favorite brew. But what do brewers themselves drink? Well, for early generations of craft brewers, they all looked up to one craft brewery, Sierra Nevada. This pioneer was the first to make, market, and establish what we now know and love as craft beer. And they did so from day one with the care and consideration for the environment that has always earned them consumer and industry respect. It's a reputation that they continue to strengthen, most recently with their innovative East Coast operation in Asheville, North Carolina, the first LEED Platinum certified brewery in the country. So grab a glass as we talk with founder and CEO Ken Grossman and his son, second generation brewer Brian Grossman, and hear the inspiring story of a beer that brews a better world. Ken, I would like to know, you know, Was there a moment that you remember you can pinpoint where you were like, I think that I will start a brewery when there are hardly any craft breweries in America and people don't know what craft beer is? What was possessing you to kind of think that you could do that? And was there a kind of experience you had or a moment you can can remember? So I don't know if you know about my early years, but I I started out homebrewing as a, a fairly young person in Southern California. I moved to Chico uh, when I was 17 in 1972, and I brought my home brewing equipment with me and continued to experiment and make beer and wine. I soon after opened a homebrew supply store in 1976. I was attending the junior college studying chemistry, working in a bicycle shop to uh, support myself, and decided I wanted to try to get into a small business selling ingredients for hobbyist home wine makers and brewers. So I did that for a couple of years. And then 1978, I went on a, a, a tour of a few of the small breweries. There were really only at that point, maybe two in the United States that had started up from scratch after prohibition and then decided that I wanted to be a, a professional brewer for my livelihood. Back in that era, you couldn't buy small brewing equipment. There's really no manufacturers in the U.S. making them. And so we um, built all the parts and uh, pieces out at the junior college, at Butte College. Took a couple of years, borrowed money from family and friends because no banks would loan us money, and did our first commercial uh, brewing November 15, 1980. When you set out to start the brewery, did you have any idea it would become what it is today? I mean, were you thinking, I want to be one of the biggest craft breweries in the country? Absolutely not. Well, to begin with, there were really no craft breweries. It was not a thing. Fritz Maytag at Anchor probably set the foundation for what was to come. And then uh, New Albion opened up in Sonoma. And then a small brewery in Colorado, Boulder Brewing, started going about the same time we did. The Barker Brewing down in Nevada, California, that a fireman and part-time brewer ran uh, for just a year or two, went out of business and Cartwright growing up in Portland. So there were, were six of us between 1978 mm. and 1982. That was the, all the small brewers in America that were uh, coming to the craft from home brewing primarily. So it wasn't really a thing that I could aspire to see. You know, I want to be the biggest one of these. I was just trying to eke out a living. Our business plan called for us to brew 2,500 barrels of beer a year, and um, we could brew about 12 brews a month, 10 barrel brews, so about 100 cases per batch and 12 times a month. So uh, it was definitely nothing that I thought was going to grow the way it grew. Um, you know, our hope was that if there was a receptive enough audience, we could expand uh, maybe 3,000 barrels a year 
And uh, we're currently doing that every day um, right now. So I'm curious, you, you didn't have anyone to look up to. Brian, you did have someone to look up to. Do you remember when it sort of registered with you that, hey, my dad's a brewer and he makes beer? I mean, what were your first memories of that? Yeah, the brewery to me was always a positive place. Yes, my father worked a lot, but he would also uh, take some time out when my mom would bring us here. So I remember playing hide and seek in grain bags and running around the brewery as you know, giant playground. There's pictures of me and case boxes of beer getting pushed down conveyors as my slide. Um, <laughs> so growing up, the brew was always a very, very positive sort of aspect. And uh, we affectionately, my sisters and I, called it the fourth child for us. So we grew up basically with viewing the brewery as sort of a sibling in essence. When I moved out to North Carolina, it was right when I had my son, my first child. So it was sort of a mental shift for me from sibling relation to sort of more a parental relation and realizing, okay, we got to foster what we've got right now. And it's been challenging over the last couple of years, to say the least. I'd love to start digging in a little on the business and Connor's our expert in that regard. So, you know, I want to turn it over to Connor for a while. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. And I mean, now you're quite different in size and scale uh, than when, than when those early days, how did you build that playbook? How, how did you think about your growth and how did you become the industry leader in this? Well, going back to 19, 19- 78, uh, I knew nothing about the commercial beer industry. I bought beer, um, but I didn't really know how it all worked. I didn't know about beer distributors. I didn't really know, you know about the TTB and all the rules and regulations we'd have to follow. So there was a big learning curve up front. And we uh, did befriend uh, a, a local beer distributor in Chico who wanted to distribute our beer. And we did the economics and realized that if we didn't self-distribute, we we wouldn't have enough cash flow to survive at at 10 barrel batches. But he was a a good sounding board and gave us some input and advice. That that was helpful. And my very first employee uh, had worked in a liquor store. We figured, well, he's got more beer, more beer knowledge and selling beer than than we do. So he became our first salesperson. And we really had to learn quickly. Um, You know, we didn't have uh, industry knowledge, but we did have a lot of passion and drive to, to try to you know, stay in business and to grow the company. Pretty soon after we started and we looked at our business plan and realized that it really wasn't very well thought out, that the volume and the cash flow uh, numbers that we had projected were not enough to survive. And some of our peers, um, I mentioned New Albion, um, they were brewing a barrel and a half uh, per batch, so 45 gallons, and they were struggling um, financially. They just didn't have enough cash flow to, to stay in business. So they were pretty rapidly trying to expand their operation and trying to raise money. And back in 1978, you know, it was one of the worst financial crises. And, and, um, and if you look at where interest rates, um, you know, they were 18, 20%. You know, nobody wanted to loan a, a small brewery money based on the historical uh, challenges that small brewers had in this country. After prohibition was repealed and um, close to a thousand breweries reopened, they all pretty much struggled. And the brewing industry went from you know, under a thousand breweries down to roughly 40 you know, when we started up. So if you were an investor, if you were a bank and looking at uh, where to put money, you would not make a bet on the brewing industry. It just had such a bad track record. So we just had to bootstrap the, the business and figure out how to grow and expand. And I say we, we pretty early on realized that our original uh, business plan was not a viable strategy. So we sort of scrapped that and went to Germany uh, as demand was growing and we were you know working hard to, to grow our business. Uh, we needed to make a big step. And so I went to Germany and bought a defunct 100-barrel brew house, so a 3,000-gallon per batch um, brew house, and rewrote the business plan and went back to banks and family and friends and still couldn't borrow any money. So we actually put that brewing equipment in storage while we just figured out uh, ways to expand our operations. So we eventually got up to about uh, 10,000 barrels using the home build equipment that I'd put together. And that was enough to finally get a bank to look at giving us some money. 
we uh, got an SBA loan for about a million dollars and that allowed us to do for the next big phase of expansion. And we started building on the 20th Street Brewery where we are today. And that, um, I rewrote the business plan this time thinking I was being really bold. And I, I rewrote it that uh, we would grow to 60,000 barrels was our target. And we had been at 10,000. So that was a pretty lofty um, growth uh, goal, I thought. And our first year, um, in 1988, um, we brewed something like 20,000 barrels. The next year, about 30,000 barrels. The next year, about 45,000 barrels. And the year after that, about 60,000. So we really grew into our full design capacity with just a, a matter of years. And at that point in time, the craft industry was struggling a little bit, but uh, uh, certainly there were some growth opportunities. And, and we were in a pretty good position to take advantage of that. So we just figured out ways to add more fermentation tanks, to upgrade our brewing facility. And we grew to almost 300,000 barrels um, by 1997. And at that point, I had bought my partner out and we did a, another major expansion and expanded the facility to nearly a million barrels here in Chico. And at that point, we did have enough of a track record. I could get bank financing and, and we were able to finance uh, the majority of of that expansion, both for cash flow and through some some debt financing. And order of magnitude now, what's the size relative to what it was even in 97, 2000? Well, we're uh, total capacity, probably close to a million and a half barrels between both facilities. And we've sort of rationalized volume. So shipping beer is costly and it has a high carbon footprint. And so the farther you ship, the, you know, the more expensive and, and greater costs are incurred. So We've now split the country in about half. And so the North Carolina brewery supplies you know, most of the East Coast markets and uh, the Chico, California brewery, most of the West Coast. And we also do some exporting to Europe out of the Mills River Brewery. And we do a little bit of exporting to Australia out of the Chico Brewery. Um, do you have any sense for how, how you guys think about the size of the craft and the craft beer industry as a whole? How many barrels do you think is, is that a year right now? In the oh, US? boy. Uh, craft beer is probably, um, well, it depends on what you classify as craft beer. So, um, sure. cause there, there's some blurred lines there across the industry. Um, you know, there's almost uh, what, eight or 9,000 breweries now in America. Um, the majority are very small, producing um, 100 to 1,000 barrels a year, a lot of brew pub um, kind of operations. And then above that, the next sort of tier of, of growth uh, or tier of, of scale would be sort of a regional brewery uh, who's packaging most of the beer and distributing throughout multiple states. And then there's a handful that are on the national level that are considered you know, craft type brewers. A number of those are now owned by major brewers, though. So um, there's sure. uh, uh, breweries that used to be sort of called craft brewers due to the fact that they were independent and now they're still producing similar kinds of beers, but they're owned by, you know, Anheuser Busch or Miller or Gores or uh, one of the European or Asian breweries. I mean, it really feels listening to you tell the story that you were an incredible visionary. <laughs> Even hearing, you know, thinking through the, the demand cycles over the last three, four decades. It didn't seem like there was ever a shortage of demand for Sierra Nevada beers. <laughs> when you first were thinking about this, or, and you know, you had your homebrew business, did you recognize that there was an underserved or unserved market, or did you just want to start making beer that you like, or both? As fair, we did realize there was an underserved market, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the U.S. brewing industry had been shrinking for many, many years, going into the late seventies which is when it hit its low point. And we did think that there was uh, now a, a place for uh, distinctive small batch beer, particularly in, in places like the Bay Area of California or Oregon or Colorado. There were some hotbeds of progressive food culture where there were you know, cheese maker, artisan cheesemakers and small coffee roasters and artisan bakeries and, and those kinds of businesses were starting to pop up and, and be able to make a unique product that was distinctive from sort of the rest of the industry and carve out a niche there. So we did think that there was the potential now with the consolidation 
of the U.S. brewing industry, and and most of the beers on the market um, at the time were the same. I mean, essentially, they were all light lager beers. Not a lot of difference between them. You couldn't, you know, if you blind tasted people on them. Um, the major beers that were on the shelf, most people probably couldn't tell the difference. So we consciously said, let's make something that is unique and different and stand out. So we went with uh, a hoppy pale ale in part because our technology was somewhat limited and you know, we could make a, a top fermented bottle conditioned beer in our primitive equipment. And we probably couldn't make a really nuanced light lager with what we were doing, but we didn't think there was a market for a craft um, nuanced light lager. We wanted to make something that was bold and, and uh, set us aside from what else you could get off on, on the shelf. So we targeted sort of the import shelf. Uh, as I mentioned, we had individual bottles, no six packs, and that's where those beers would be, uh, would be singles on the shelf. So that's sort of where we started. We priced ourselves at about the highest import price, which at the time was 85 cents a bottle. And so that was sort of our, our target price. And we worked backwards from there to figure out what we were going to sell it for and you know, hope there was enough margin in there that we could survive. Um, so we didn't have a, a lot of industry knowledge and didn't do any market research, really, other than our sense that the opportunity is now here because of the fact that the industry is consolidated so much. And there's really not a lot of options for people who don't want to drink American light lager. So, I mean, when, when we sampled our beer, it was hoppy and, you know, people weren't used to uh, in your face hop aromas or fairly high levels of bitterness. And so when we would sample our pale ale, um, you know, 90% of the people who tasted it were like, oh, this is not good. And 10% loved it. And, um, you know, we realized that we were going after this fringe beer drinker at the time. Um, there wasn't the knowledge that we have today. Um, there are consumers that know more about beer and hops than I knew as a brewer back in 1980 with the um, internet and with all the, the growth of the craft segment, and all the interest, there's just a, a huge amount of knowledge that wasn't in the consumer's uh, mind back when we first started. So we had to do a lot of educating. So from those early days, doing the hard work of educating consumers and building an industry, through to today, you've really remained at the forefront. It seems like today's marketplace has evolved a bit, though. Beer drinkers have a more sophisticated palate. How do you stay atop the industry like that for so long with such force? Well, we have to grow and evolve. You know, when I first started, I, I'm sure I, I said things like, oh, we'll never put beer in cans and we'll never make a hazy beer. Although, you know, our beers were, we got complaints because they were hazy back in the 80s and we did what we could to clean them up started filtering we didn't do any of that initially so you know we've just tried to grow and evolve with the consumer and, and hopefully continue to delight our drinkers and as new drinkers uh, you know come into the world we're trying to figure out how to appeal to to them as well so it also uh, keeps it fun too is, is, yeah yeah we, we get you know brewing you know be like cooking the same thing day in a day out but you know for us and our brewers and and us as consumers, um, you know, we do like variety. And so we're, we're trying to stay true to our roots, but also to uh, continue to evolve styles of beer and not beer for that matter. And we're working on lots of other projects. Consumers do change and move and, and um, you know, different trends and food and beverage come and go all the time. One trend you have avoided, but it sounds like a lot of others did not, is you've chosen to remain independent. And some of the biggest beer companies in America have have gone after other industry leaders, I'd imagine, of similar size. And those folks have decided to sell. I'm really curious, how have you thought about that over the last four decades? Well, certainly we've been approached over the years. Um, you know, there's been plenty of uh, entrees to, um, to talk to us about uh, you know, joining some other company. Most of my peers who have sold, I wouldn't say all of them, but the vast majority were forced into it due to economics of their growth uh, involved, in some cases, uh, you know, venture money, in other cases, uh, pretty significant bank debt, in other cases, um, you know, lots of partners and, and people who wanted out. And so a lot of those decisions were forced upon those owners sort of out of their control when you know the market had a downturn or when the growth did materialize the way they had projected and they had borrowed a lot of money. 
or they took on partners that you know had different ideas about the future of the companies. Others have chosen that you know they don't have any family members and there's no legacy and they're just going to exit. In our case, at least uh, you know at this point in time, I've got uh, family members interested in the company and and uh, continuing to run it, and so we've worked to try to at least have that option available. If there was. You know, a desire by any of my family members to stay the course and stay in the business. You know, Brian, for example, the idea of going to work for my father seems daunting at the very least and, and impossible <laughs> most days. It's not as bad as you think. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as a, the son of a beer icon and, you know, you grew up around it, did you always want this to be a family business? Did you want to take on a family legacy? Yeah, like I said, the the relationship that I had with the brewery when I was growing up was was very much like a family member. It's hard to think of the brewery as just a, a box with some kettles. You know, it's definitely a living, breathing entity. And you knew you never really could just turn your back on it because it's alive. Uh, it's a very different relationship. Um, so I always knew I would end up here at some capacity at some point in time. And, you know, and I had my own life's journeys, ups and downs and loves and rights like everyone else. But, you know, when you come back here, it's like there's, you know, the team's pretty involved here as well you know, with the sort of every day making the culture what it is. And it's a pretty fun place to be. Now, if my father made cat food or something like that, I don't know if I would be as as involved per se. So there's two aspects of the company, right? There's the actual products and the innovation side of what we do. And then there's the family side of what we do. So both can highlight differently. Can I weigh in here? I want to hear a little bit about not only is it your family, but you also have in-laws. And Brian, you shared a story about your honeymoon and what happened, (laughs) how it became very real to your wife, what she was marrying into as well. Yeah, the story there was... uh, you know, we were just got married. We were sitting on the beach in Costa Rica, closing the deal for North Carolina. So I spent most of my honeymoon actually on the phone and we got the deal worked out where it was, oh no, the governor's coming tomorrow. So we had to quick uh, adjust our plans and, and make it to North Carolina for the announcement. Yeah, the brewery is much larger than, like I said, just the box. It's a lot going on there. <laughs> well, I have to say, after being at Mills River, all of us on the crew, everyone was like, should we just apply for a job here? I mean, can we stay? It's just so beautiful. And the way that you've made it into this sort of example of what sustainability can be, like making all the right decisions beyond just for your bottom line, but for the planet and for the community. Why did you decide to worry about that at all. You know, you're making great beer and you have this awesome family business, but you're also going to make all of these decisions around sustainability. Well, I guess it probably goes back to my earliest years where I didn't have anything. So we were total bootstrapped. I had a 57 Chevy flatbed truck that I would drive up and down California, Oregon, Washington, buying surplus salvaged equipment to build the brewery out of. We had no other alternatives. We had to be super resourceful. And so that's sort of where we started. And as I mentioned, we had gardens and, you know, we composted and we did all that stuff our whole lives. And then as we got more resources, so as I started to build the 20th Street Brewery, we were able to do more. So we put in energy saving lighting and motors and all those sorts of things that we could uh, with new construction where it's, it's a bit tougher to retrofit when you're on a shoestring, but if you're building new, it's only you know, marginally more to, to do the right thing there. And then as we continued to grow and evolve when we went to build Mills River, I had the opportunity to design and engineer the whole facility at one time. Went into it you know, wanting to be LEED certified just as, as, as part of our, our goal when we were building a new plant. And then the more we got into it and we hired a, a, a great engineer, We were like, well, we can get silver. Let's go for lead silver. And then we were like, well, we can hit gold. We're we're pretty sure we we got everything in place to to hit gold certification. And then when we were analyzing, like, God, we're not that far from platinum. Let's just see if we can get all the way to platinum. So that was a difficult and expensive and painful ordeal to, to do that on a project of that scale because we didn't do what a lot of lead facilities are where they just get a lead 
office building, uh, we did the whole production plant. And so that involved modeling all the processes. And we spent a lot of time and energy on going through the, the operations of brewing beer and getting it up to that lead platinum level, as well as the offices and restaurant and all the rest of that. So it was really a challenge we put in front of ourselves that let's see if we can you know go all the way and and do as as good of a job as we can at being an efficient brewer. And in part it's because you know we acknowledge as as manufacturers we use resources. You know we use water, we use energy, we have trucks. You know we have all these uh, processes that we need to pay attention to. And so I think it's just the right thing to do for anybody who's you know in a manufacturing world or in any business for that matter to at least figure out how to be as efficient with the resources as you can just because it's something that we don't want to waste uh, resources and we don't want to contribute any, any more to the degradation of the planet than you know than we have to. And you are, I mean, you're the second largest landowner on the French Broad River. It comes with some responsibility. And I'm curious, Brian, when you're, you know, managing and maintaining that facility, there are a lot of small breweries in the area. Are they coming to you for advice or are they looking at what you're doing and thinking, how can I implement this on a smaller scale with less capital to start? I mean, what are you telling them? Yeah, we get contacted by brewers daily. And the thing we always tell them is just start somewhere. As long as you start it, it's easier to sort of keep that philosophy going than just saying, oh, it's too far out there. So we tell them just to start with something. It doesn't matter what it is. And there's plenty of times where we've given materials to other brewers to help them out in a pinch, or we've done laboratory samples to help them out in a pinch, but very much a, a, a good community out there, not just in Western North Carolina, but all over the, the U.S. Uh, brewers helping brewers is a very, very common thing. At any scale, you can do something. You can make a difference at any scale. Having you know scale does give you the ability to do more capital intensive projects that may not be practical at a small scale. Both of our facilities, we capture the carbon dioxide from fermentation that's purified and liquefied and and used for the CO2 needs around the brewery. And, you know, that was something we did mainly driven by, you know, we shouldn't be releasing all this carbon dioxide, but there's also a, a financial benefit. You're not dependent on CO2 suppliers to truck CO2 in that may be coming from fossil fuel sources or fertilizer sources. And during the pandemic, when driving went down significantly, the production of fuel alcohol pretty much stopped. And that was a big source of carbon dioxide. So for us, we we did it for the environmental benefit and for some monetary return. But in reality, in the end, it really was um, a great thing that we're self-sufficient on carbon dioxide. So we're not dependent on the industry, which uh, right now is, again, going through some hiccups with supply shortages. And uh, we were getting panic calls from brewers who couldn't package beer because they didn't have any carbon dioxide and couldn't get any carbon dioxide for weeks in some cases. So that was just an added benefit of doing that. But we didn't go into it with that notion. It just ended up working out that way. You've really built an incredible family legacy as you've helped to establish the legacy of the entire craft beer industry. What's the one lesson that you want to share with future generations as a whole when it comes to your success? One thing I I think that uh, I do get asked fairly often by people wanting to be in business for themselves. And the message I try to get across is you you better be passionate about uh, what you choose uh, if you really want to be successful because it's hard uh, the, you know, being in business for yourself, being in this industry, being probably in lots of industries, there are daily challenges. There are what seemingly insurmountable um, odds against you. But I think, uh, you know, hard work, dedication, focus, and, and never giving up is probably one of those things that you, you need to go into whatever challenge you have with, with those tenants that um, if you're going to survive, it's not going to be easy, but if you work hard, um, you will most likely succeed. I'm going to say the same thing, but just a different way, which is the details really matter. I also know that you talked about, you know, when you first brewed your first beer and you said actually what you remembered less was the beer and more about fixing things and all that you learned, you know, when something's broken. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter whatever you're doing. Having a mastery of skill set 
for your craft is going to really pay off, pay dividends in the long run. And the story that you're talking about is I, when I was working in the maintenance department here at this brewery, that's probably where I learned more about the actual process of making beer is when something would go wrong and you'd have to go take apart a piece of equipment and you truly understood what happens when a valve opens or what happens when heat supplied or whatever the, the application is. And, you know, as my father was saying, it doesn't matter if you're a chef, if you're a brewer, a weaver, whatever, you know, stressing over the details, really slowing it down and really getting it right is going to pay dividends for you in the long run. Cheers to Ken and Brian Grossman for this inspiring conversation. And thanks to Kate Tucker for joining us today. Consensus and Conversation is hosted by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode is produced by our very own Will Gatchel and Chandler Bramstead. Executive produced by me with editing from Maddie Zampati from Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to Consensus Creative Director Kate Tucker. See you next week. And don't forget to rate us and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. <laughs>